The opening lines for the sermon this morning are actually for my wife, Pat, who uh, is worshiping with us today, I think, but not certain. Um, I have this written down someplace to give her, and it's not needed anytime soon, I hope, but it's words for an epitaph that um, if I were able to see it on my tombstone, I would appreciate these words being there. And that is, his faith informed his life and preaching about the message he offered through his sermons. His faith in God's working in his life shaped how he lived and how he ministered to the world. It is my hope, my prayer, and I would invite you to, <clears throat> to pray for me that I ultimately stand worthy of this statement. In many ways, my friends, that is the call that we all have in our lives, to notice how God is working in our lives through our music, through our gifts of, of uh, teaching, through all of the ways that, uh, that we share with the world. So I'm wondering this morning how God is working in your lives today in these challenging times. How is your faith helping you cope? How is your faith getting you up in the morning? How is your faith leading you to the, to the choices you're making and how to respond to others? Maybe there won't be so much bitter lemon taste in that process. How you are responding to the needs you see around you. Well, the story of Joseph, read once, told by uh, uh, Trish also, uh, and now by me, is a an beautiful and important story in the Hebrew scriptures. The story of Joseph reconciling with his brothers in our lesson from Genesis today gives us, gives us a powerful example of how God worked in the lives of the sons of Jacob in the Hebrew scriptures. Do you remember the drama of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? The beautiful musical that uh, tells the story in very vi vivid ways. Jacob gives his favorite son this amazing coat, which is what starts all of this, I suppose, which upsets his brothers big time. And the brothers get so upset that they trick Joseph and throw him into a pit and hold him in that pit until some traffickers uh, come along, labor traffickers, uh, and they sell him to these guys or, or people and who end up taking him down to Egypt. But God works in Joseph's life in ways that bring him to a position of leadership in the Egyptian government. And there's a famine in the land. Joseph uh, is ultimately appointed to head up the program of feeding the hungry. And Jacob is hungry and his sons are hungry and Jacob sends his sons down to, to uh, Egypt, also sending Benjamin, who was the youngest and apparently a favorite of, of Joseph. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. It's an amazing statement of forgiveness right there. Don't be angry and upset with what you did. Because something good happened. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which we will need to plow and our harvest. So God sent before you to preserve uh, for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for many survivors. And then this line, this important line, 
And so it was not you who sent me here, but God. In other words, God is the one working all of this out. Joseph let God, and he could have resisted, but he let God uh, work in his life during this time of famine and, uh, and health instability. God, Joseph could have taken great pride in the achievements that he, he, uh, he had in, in, in Egypt, but he doesn't do that, does he? He's allowed God to work as God wanted him to work in his life. And in faith, Joseph overcomes the resentment and the longing for his father and family. In his longing, Joseph forgives and is reconciled with his brothers. That's God's working through Joseph. So faith and forgiveness are powerful companions, powerful means for renewal and hope in our lives. And then the woman came back to Jesus, went to her knees and begged, Master, help me. He said, it's not right to take bread out of children's mouths and throw it to dogs. We always so easily imply that she might have been in the dog category because she wasn't of that uh, ethnic group. But she was quick. You're right, Master, but beggar dogs do not do get the scraps from the master's table. Don't I deserve a little more, at least I'm human, a little more than the dogs? She's got her hand on Jesus' arm, I imagine, squeezing it a little bit in her strength uh, and pushing back. And what does Jesus do? Something that we don't hear very often in the scriptures, hardly ever. Jesus gave in. Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. And right then, her daughter became well. So you see, my friends, faith also shapes and informs how we deal in our lives, especially in times of crisis. Faith encourages us to persist. The Canaanite woman is stubborn, stubborn in her faith. Indeed, she persists to the point that Jesus seems to have no choice but to respond to her. In the modern vernacular of the message, that translation that we read sometimes, Matthew has Jesus say, Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. As far as we know, there, these are the, there are only a few characters in the Gospels who persist and push back against Jesus. So when you do that, my friends, don't feel guilty. When you yell at God, don't feel guilty about it. Believe that it is, uh, it is a good thing to do. They may not do this out of a sense of strong faith. I, I would suggest it's really out of great need um, and desperation that, that they push back against Jesus' initial response to their need expressed in a plea for help. How persistent, my friends, my question for you today, how persistent are you being these days in keeping hope alive in your spiritual life? in your life with the world. I just, uh, a friend shared an interview um, that is just working in my heart and my, my gut in it yesterday, an interview with, with Ann Patchett, uh, a prolific author who's written about, I think, nine novels and, and many other, other books. She owns an independent bookstore, uh, Parnassus, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, 
and lives there and writes uh, there. And she was interviewed about her, her newest book uh, titled Tom Lake. And I won't go into the story, but she talks about, um, about the value of stories, but also the value of books and children. And she said, if you want to keep our children safe, and that's uppermost in our minds these days, especially as our, as our children go back to school. But if you want to keep our children safe, then don't ban books. If you want to keep our children safe, ban guns, she says. You, you don't ban something we care about. If you want to keep your children safe, you don't keep a book away from them. If a lonely Canaanite woman can push back against Jesus, then my friends, we can. And resist those efforts in our society these days, and there are a, a variety of them that are not keeping our children safe, but causing them to be in harm's way even more than, than they are now. Indeed, how faithful are you in your daily practices of prayer and contemplation? It is out of our such spiritual practices that our faith is, is not only deepened, but our faith is strengthened in ways that bring us to a stronger conviction of what God is calling us to be and do in these days. My friends in Christ, God does not just call musicians and pastors and teachers uh, to their ministries. No, God calls each one of us to a place of faith, faith that forgives, faith that persists, faith that opens us to God's call upon our lives. My most sincere prayer this day is that you will not give up, that you will persist in these challenging times to allow God to work in your lives, to work on your faith, to deepen your faith, to expand your faith. Yes, indeed, for sure. May it be so in your lives and mine this day. Amen.